Terry, don't leave today. I have your gift card in the car. I forgot it. It's in the cup holder, so I wouldn't forget it. But at least it's here. There you go. On that note, in the bag is blank papers and pens. If you completed this week's reading, um, whether, whether you listened to it or you read it all last night or whatever, if you read this week's reading, we covered um, in the Old Testament Joshua 13 uh, through the end of 24, and in Luke, uh, the beginning of 18 through the end of 21. So that's where we covered this week um, in the, in the one-year Bible. As it's coming around, fill it out. You know the drill. Um, let's see. Let people get in here a second. We're going to try something a little bit different with the comments today, and it's not that different for you guys. Um, but if you have a new thought, I'm just trying to figure out how to say this. If you have a new thought, go ahead and raise your hand. And if you get the microphone and you get the opportunity to share your new thought, um, everybody put their hands down. If you want to build on that, raise your hand. I will say, all right, time for a new thought, probably multiple times today then. That way we have good discussion on one thought. So uh, like Nancy, I know you've, you've got your list, right? It, and um, so that way you can give us one piece of your list and we can talk about it for a second and then we can go back to uh, somebody else's co uh, new comment and back to one of yours or whatever it might be. But that way, if we have any discussion on that topic, you know, like one of the stories in Luke, um, something like that, we can talk about it a little bit before we move on. So I'm going to try and do that. I hope it's helpful. It might be confusing and I might go back, so we'll see. All right, so like I said, we were in Luke and Joshua today. Um, these are my official notes for today. It's been a busy, crazy week. So uh, just, just off of the top of my brain, really, okay, I've got a couple things here. Um, in Joshua, we've been talking about all the different tribes and their lands and where they're settling and what the Levites get and where that is uh, geographically. So I don't know if any of you guys popped up a map this week, but this was the week to pop up a map in the book of Joshua, right? Um, another thing that I thought was really, really cool, and, and you guys might touch on this, I feel like we'll be in Luke more than anything today, but um, something that remained true for Joshua and his leadership in all of these tribes, right now at least, is they are remembering to stay true to God. They're remembering to read the law of Moses. Um, am I out of the camera? Oh, no. Bryce, this is my spot. Okay. And so they're still staying focused on God for the most part. So that, that's my little quick thoughts on Joshua. Um, in Luke, we have quite a few different stories and interactions of Jesus. That's what I call them, interactions of Jesus. One of the first ones we see is uh, the guy, uh, we call him the rich young ruler usually. It's really just a description of him, not his name per se. Um, but Jesus teaches the principle of, if you really want to be a follower of me, you might have to leave everything. Because the rich young ruler had done that, except for he was wealthy, and that made him sad, right? And so uh, Jesus takes this and teaches it to the crowd, saying, you might even have to leave your own father, your mother, your family to be a follower of me. And some people know that more than others. Some people still to this day have to go a separate path than their family, and it's a tough thing. We, uh, we read about Zacchaeus, the tax collector, the wee little man. He's in this uh, account of Luke. We read about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the stealing of a donkey. Um, <laughs> borrowing. borrowing of a donkey. Um, if, the, if the people weren't crying out, the rocks and the stones would cry out. Stones is how Luke says it. Um, things like that. Um, Jesus hanging out in Jerusalem is kind of where we ended this week's reading. Uh, dealing with the Pharisees, dealing with the Sadducees, dealing with their spies who were trying to uh, essentially trap Jesus in multiple different comments we've seen this week. And then we kind of uh, also looked at um, Jesus entering the temple and it, 
his perspective on the temple, he uses it as, as an opportunity to talk about the widow's might and the, the small giving versus the, uh, the chauvinist showing off giving and all of that sort of stuff that was happening in the temple. So that's kind of Luke. There's the, the very quick. See, I did really good with notes this week because I didn't do any. Um, they were really quick and short. Yay. Yay. You're welcome. <laughs> all right. I think Bryce is going to come out here with a microphone, and we'll do our, our normal comments. Did everybody get the basket as it's going around? A couple more? Perfect. OK. Bryce is coming with the microphone, and we'll get started here. So what did you guys see today? Oh, Kale's got it. Kale, I forget about you, man. It's not because I don't love you, though. All right, what did you guys see this week in your reading? We'll come over here to Kim first. Again, my idea is give us a thought, let's talk about it, and we'll move on to the next one after a minute. So, uh, be good. It is turned on. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, my question is, like, so in this He did just tip over, I think. Not, not to minimize it, but I do think that's what happened. Okay. Um, so my question is about, well, not necessarily a question. So is this where, like, all the fighting in the Middle East is coming from? Because of, like, the book of Joshua, like, they gave the land to the, to the inheritance. And, like, is that, is that what's, what so, a big chunk of that fighting is going on? Yes and no. I'm so in that, so. E even from, we're going to talk about Abraham here in a minute. Even from Abraham, and like we talked about Noah last week, um, there has been this division of people continuing, um, and that division of people still is the division of people in the Middle East to some degree, yes. So I don't know if that's a good answer or not, but what's that? The Arabs and the Jews, yeah. So yes, I mean, it's so many years removed, but yes. Is that, is that what you had? Okay. I said I'm obviously ignorant in it, but I didn't realize that like they like specifically said, you know, this is your land, this is your land, this is your land, and then like you see in the the one part where they kind of fight over um, someone had built an an altar that they were like, oh, that's not oh. godly, and uh, so we had some good discussion about the altar um, because they're basically they kind of put themselves on the line and they're like, well. This, this really is for God, just in case, kind of, is their answer, right? And, and if it really isn't for God, let him take care of us, take us out. Um, I don't think they would have said that if they had really, really had malicious things, because I don't think that's a wise thing to say to God. So we, ha we had some discussion about that. Terry, did you have a continued thought? Kale? One of the things that I noticed in the reading is the fact that they were supposed to completely wipe out the people that were there, mm -hmm. and they didn't. And there, it's really interesting that, and I couldn't find the exact wording, but I read it several times where it said that they couldn't because they weren't strong enough or populous enough. And then later on it says they didn't, you know, but they made them forced labor. Mm -hmm. So at some point, they could have wiped them all out and chose not to. They chose to make them slaves instead, which was contrary to what God said, mm -hmm. which could be part of the fighting too, because if you entirely eliminate a people, not really anybody left to fight. Mm -hmm. And we kind of see, we saw that starting uh, last week in the reading, right, where they kind of got tricked into the treaty, and then so they kept them as slaves, kind of the beginning of that um, in the storyline. Continued thought. All right. New thoughts. Good job, Kale. She's getting there. Um, frustrated. Anyways, Luke. Um, Luke. 21, 24, they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem, Jerusalem will be trampled under foot by the Gentiles 
until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And I had a whole bunch of verses from Isaiah that actually prophesies this, talking about God's vengeance. And I can't find my piece of paper with them all. I'm like, ah. Oh. But I, if I find my piece of paper, can I? Yeah. What's your big idea with it, though? My um, big idea yeah, is that. that when we, when I've read this scripture all the time, we see that Jesus knows that the fall of Jerusalem is coming, mm -hmm. that Romans are going to come in, and it was very brutal. They killed everybody that was living. They seen them living, and they would kill them. And it was very brutal. But in Isaiah, several times in Isaiah and other, other books of the Old Testament, it was prophesied that this would happen. Yeah. And it was prophesied, and it talks about God's vengeance and that God is the one that made that happen. And my idea is Jesus knows they're going to put him on the cross. They're going to crucify him. And he tells us vengeance is his. In 70 AD, he takes his vengeance on Jerusalem. When he's in heaven, in the spiritual realm, what are, you know, sitting on the throne, he was crucified. He's back up there in heaven. He takes his revengeance. Vengeance, and it talks about his vengeance, and it's going to happen to Jerusalem several times in the book of Isaiah. And I wrote all those verses down, but. Okay, and then yesterday's reading, it said in verse 21 of the first part of Joshua, maybe? Judges, yeah. It said, the Benjamites, however, did not drive out the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. And to this day, the Jebusites live there with the Benjaminites. So that was one of the tribes that didn't drive them out, and it was Jerusalem very specifically mentioned. Before because it relaxes me. <laughs> See, we read it the night of, but it's the day of. So we should maybe do that. All right, Dennis. Jebus means Jeru uh, Jerusalem, or the Jebusites, and that's their name is about Jerusalem. It's just the same word, I guess. Okay. <clears throat> All right. New thought. Pretty certain we'd have a bunch out of Luke this week. Oh no, we're we're not even close to time. I guess I do need to talk for half the time. Because <laughs> we were just there was in a lot of like Luke was a lot of things that we've already talked about and already read about. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard to like pick things out. Like I did not yeah. Okay, so Terry's, uh, Terry's over here saying, um, run with the thought that in the Old Testament, every promise of God has been fulfilled. What does that mean? Everything's happened so far that's supposed to happen. Okay, so in the context of Joshua right now, the, the biggest promise is the promised land and God mm -hmm. delivering them out of and then into that, Right. But is it an accurate statement? Better be. It's God's. Well. And then, but yet at the same time, they have, they don't realize everything yet, but this is the foundations for Christ to come as well, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, we, were, we were talking a little bit about that this week. Um, well, I guess I, I looked at it a little bit in my sermon too. Uh, the bloodlines that equal to Jesus here, we're, we're building the foundations of the beginnings of that. 
So I think that's kind of interesting. Do you have more, Terry? Up front, Kale. I, just, I made her do it, so she didn't raise her hand. The point in Joshua, and several times they've said this, they make the point that all of the good promises that the Lord gave you have been fulfilled. And the point there is that if you don't do what God has said, all of the promises that he said on the bad things that would happen are also going mm -hmm. to be fulfilled. Yes. Um, and I think probably one of Nancy's verses that she was going to find for us, um, we saw this week too in Joshua, that being stated to them about how God can destroy as quickly as he can, pro more quickly because they spent a lot of years getting there, right? Absolutely. Okay, new thought. Go for it, Nancy. Um, also so frustrated, but anyways. Um, when we read about the Canaanites and they uh, being made to do forced labor and they put the Canaanites in forced labor, but they not only just drive them out. In um, X, it was a Genesis when Ham went into Noah. Noah cursed yep. him and said the Canaanites would be uh, slaves to their brothers for eternity or to, the, where was it? In Ham, where Should be it? like 11. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Um, where was it? And I think they, he mentioned the Canaanites specifically being servants to their brothers. So it would be uh, 9 verse 25, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. So. so they were cursed, and now they are serving their brothers. Yeah. Again, continuing uh, the history of what, yeah, we, we read that last week too. That's the part of the kid's story we don't talk about as much. The trouble after and then the cursing that comes from it. How about this one? Um, we, we talk about this story a lot, but I think there's some really big implications. We read about the story of Zacchaeus today, or this week. I say today, like the, all, the week's one whole day. This week, we read about Zacchaeus, right? Um, why, why do you, what are you, some things that you guys think are powerful of the story of Zacchaeus? And I'll let you run with that. And if, uh, if you're not hitting what I'm thinking, we'll talk about it. The people thought he was a bad man, and Jesus shouldn't be consorting with him. Yes, okay. So the people thought he was a bad man. Why? Well, he was a tax collector, right? So uh, a little bit of background on tax collectors. First off, we understand why you don't like tax collectors. <laughs> right? We still get that. We, the, the word tax already makes us cringe. But... Um, a lot of times we have tax collectors who basically are sellouts in the, in the bad way, right? They have left their people to go work for the Romans, and now not only that have they betrayed people, but it's common practice that tax collectors make good money. Why? Because when you're the tax collector, you get to say how much the tax is, right? So you owe $20 in taxes, you owe $40 in taxes. And so that's an assumed position of all tax collectors. So that's why Zacchaeus is an uh, outcast. He's not so like. He's collecting for the Romans, but he's a Jew. Yes. Usually right, and that's, um, it, you think about like Matthew, same case. Yeah, you guys, you gotta use that microphone. Um, collecting for the Romans, but they were Jew, betraying their own people to serve Caesar, right? Yeah, continued thought. Yeah, the, it says that Zacchaeus came down joyfully. Where was it? Um, he was about to pass that way, verse 5, and Zacchaeus hurried and came down. It was before that, though. It says he's joyful. Then came down and received him joyfully. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly or joyfully. That's Luke 19, verse 6. So is that Zacchaeus being joyful? Or Jesus being joyful. All right. right. Yeah. I see what you're saying. I got your question now. Yeah. Um, it's, it's on the 18th, by the way, if you guys only have your one-year Bible. So um, it says that, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief class 
tax collector and was rich. He was seeking to see though, see who Jesus was, but on the account of the crowd, he could not. Um, so he ran ahead, climbed up onto a tree, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, hurry down and hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house. So Jesus like picked him specifically. Mm-hmm. He's just like, come on, get out of the tree. I need your house. And so he, like, got down all excited. Yeah. And he says, um, well, people were grumbling about it, and Zacchaeus said, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Yes. All right, let's put a a pin in what he does, because I'm going to come back to you over here. So uh, he came down from the tree. He came down at once and welcomed him gladly, and all the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. So I think the answer works for both here. I think, like Kim just said, Zacchaeus is excited. You know, that's a good word to use there. But also, Jesus welcomed him gladly, right? And that's why the people are now riled up, muttering, as, as the NIV says. They're muttering, how dare he uh, go to the house of a sinner, right? So I think both are applicable here because Jesus is welcoming him gladly, but Zacchaeus is literally welcoming him into his home because that's what Jesus said to do. All right, so come over here and before we bounce back to Kim's, what he did. So in application, we need to remember, Jesus did this with sinners all the time. I mean, he gets in trouble for the, with that, the tax collector, Mag, Mary Magdalene the lady at the well, the Samaritan woman, I mean, all of these outcasts. And then he looks to the Pharisees and calls them the whitewashed tombs, and they only do the outside of their cup to clean it. And we just got to be careful. We're not like that because we like each other, which is great, but that's not what our mission is. Mm -hmm. Our mission is not each other. And it's not also to just regulate and define and creates new rules, <laughs> traditions. New rules is a fine term. That's what they are, right? Not to create new rules. All right, so Jesus sought out Zacchaeus. Well, I think that's factual. But also, Kim just read it, Zacchaeus sought out Jesus. I think it's so funny in this story. This is the reason we like it for songs and for the kids and so much, because Zacchaeus was a short dude. He was a wee little guy, right? That's what the song says. Something that the reason that's so important to the story, because it's like, why do we need to know if he's four foot five or not, right? The reason that's so important, because it shows how he sought out Jesus. The crowd was too much. He couldn't see, so he climbed a tree. Um, you know, sometimes I think, uh, like, like my mom Christine was saying, we think we just need to be here. But also, we need to be watching for those people that are seeking, right? I think there's people in our culture that are proverbially climbing the tree to find Jesus, they just don't know where, right? So they're looking over the crowds. We still, we still have that in our culture today. So I think kind of the call, if we want to emulate Jesus, uh, we have this opportunity now to say, hey, I see you up in that tree. Let's go to God's house together or, you know, whatever. Welcome to my house. Take me to your house. Let's, let's have a relationship. Brenda's got a continued comment over here. Kale. So we're, we're kind of at the point of seeking both directions. Okay. To, to me, it means that we shouldn't judge quickly. These people were judging as not worthy to see Jesus. There's so many times that we judge people as unworthy. And to me, we need to be careful. Absolutely. So I wanted to make that comment. It ties us to what Zacchaeus has, does now. Um, up here, Sandra's got the next one. Um, we still have this in our culture, too, because we see Zacchaeus making a big change immediately. Um, but we still see this in our culture. People put themselves in a box, or maybe other people put them there for them, like in Zacchaeus's case. Um, but we, I've still heard this saying multiple times before. I'm too big of a sinner, or I, I'm too messed up. My family's too messed up. I got too much stuff, you know. I, I got, you, you can't. And we still do that. Zacchaeus is a prime example of why that's not a thing. 
Because when, when you come to Jesus, all of that can be put behind you. All right, Sandra, go for it. Oh, just a quick thought. I think Jesus was also doubly happy because Zacchaeus was from the line of Abraham. And Jesus, knowing all this, he was like, oh, family, I get to talk to him. I get to bring him back where he needs to be, plus deal with all the other sinners and the sick people, so to speak. Plus to make the example. It all worked out together. Yeah. All right, continued thought about Zacchaeus? I just wanted Wait. to say none of us are worthy to see Jesus. Well, yeah. That's true. Yeah, it, so it's, it doesn't matter if you're a tax collector that keeps off the top or not, or if you're, we're, the answer is yes, we all are too big of sinners, right? That's the beauty of it, is that there's no such thing as too big of a sinner. All right, Dennis. Uh, it's interesting that uh, <clears throat> Jesus doesn't even ask him or tell him how good or bad he was or what he needs to do. He comes popping up with all these things, how he's going to make things right if he's done something wrong and uh, by way of the taxation, and that if he, if he has, you know, uh, for sure, he'll even uh, repay it four times over. And this is what the Bible talks about when it talks about doing acts meant for repentance. Repentance doesn't just mean stop doing bad and feeling icky about it. It means turning around and trying to undo the evils you have done to people or God. Yeah. And Zacchaeus here says, I'll do it four times over. And uh, it, it, so it kind of makes me think he either wasn't doing a whole lot of bad to too many people uh, or he was willing to. But anyway, repentance without even being asked for it, boy, that's something that most of us are a long way from. Yeah. We don't even like to when we're pointed out. Yeah, that's true. Um, and I see both of those pieces, right? Maybe... Zacchaeus didn't really have, um, he, he, he didn't have that much to, that he was actually doing wrong, and also he was just getting the bad rap from everybody else. But at the same time, he is truly expressing repentance, like Dennis is saying, uh, he wants to make it right. So this is what Kim read, and I'll read it here again for us, verse 8 in Luke 19. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And that's what Dennis was just talking about. He's like going above and beyond what we would consider enough for repentance, right? We'd say, well, just make it even. No. He's saying, I will give, I will take care of people, and I will undo four times over what I've done wrong to somebody. I've, that's a, a great example of repentance. Continued thought on that? Okay. Zacchaeus in general. I think, it's, I think it's a cool thing to look at the Zacchaeus story a little more because sometimes we just, we just kind of run over it. Yep. All right, Kale's got you in the back one second there. Nancy, go for it. I don't know if Zacchaeus was repenting. He, I thought he was saying, I don't. I'm a, I'm a fair, I'm an adjust, and I'm honest. Well, I think, I think Did there's... Did he say he did anything wrong? I think there's both there because... Um, I think you could read the, I do give half of my possessions to the poor as a current, maybe. But the, the next piece is, I will. So whether or not, like Dennis was saying, whether or not he had actually cheated many people or not, he's going, he will. So that's a, that's a form of Give event. to the poor. Yeah. But he never said he cheated them. He said he was always honest, right? Um, it doesn't, he doesn't say whether he, he says or not. He just says he will if, they, if he has. But again, I think our minds automatically. So he's not doing it on purpose. Right. If he has. If I think our minds automatically he did fill that. If something wrong, he will make it right. I think the human part of it uh, refills the fact of, well, if you say you're going to pay somebody back four times over, you must not have that many people to pay back. I think our brain kind of does that, but we don't know. We don't know. Kim. Well, and they call him a sinner, but he could possibly just be a sinner by association mm -hmm. just oh, yeah. because of the fact that he's a tax he's collector a tax he's collector. automatically oh you're a bad human because absolutely you're a tax collector <laughs> and you we don't know that like but he, people called him that and it could just been you know guilty by association <laughs> yeah and again we uh we know that that's probably true to some degree but we also read like nancy was saying he was wealthy was that honest wealth or was it uh you know 90 10 or was it 80 20 you know like um, what percent of that? We don't know. Um, but we do see 
from the very beginning of Zacchaeus' story, he has this heart to seek out Jesus. I mean, he knows Jesus is coming through town. Zacchaeus is there in Jericho, and he wanted to see Jesus, but he was too short. You know, that's the one, his shortcoming is he's literally too short. So because of that, we see him climbing the tree. We see him having the desire to find Jesus. And so I, I think there's multiple good things for us to take from that. Um, there's no such thing as uh, too bad of a sinner, even if culture thinks you are. Uh, we will still do that in our culture to this day. I think that's an important thing for us to say. And there is seekers. There's people standing in trees that we need to say, hey, come be with us. Sometimes we don't look for them. Go for it, Kim. It might be dead because I left them everything on yesterday. <laughs> you were a little distracted. There's a lot going on. Okay. Anybody else on Zacchaeus? Okay. Okay, we got two new thoughts. Uh, Kale, is your battery light on or any lights on at all? Is it what color is it? Okay, well, come try it. <laughs> Okay, so Proverbs, I'm, I'm Proverbs from the 17th. Okay, and go back a couple days. Verse 10, where there is strife, there is pride, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. And I think we as a people, like the second half, wisdom is found in those who take advice, but I'm not sure I think too much about whether there is strife, there is pride. Something I just, it made me stop and think. All right, let's break this down for just a second. I think it can make us think um, because we don't use these terms too often because they're scary. What does strife mean? Conflict, Conflict dissension. Uh, we would probably use the term fighting because we use that term pretty broad in our culture, right? Uh, fighting does not necessarily mean swords and shields. It means interactions with people. It means strife. So when there is strife, there is pride. Digging a little deeper into that half of it. If you're willing to fight over something, you must be a little proud over it, right? That's, that's Harold's take of what does this mean? Yes, Americans, we don't ever deal with that, do we? We don't have any pride in anything. And this is a fun little fact I saw. Uh, there's weird maps about random things you can find on the internet. Um, the most state pride runs right down the middle. Montana, Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico. Everywhere else doesn't really care. <laughs> and Texas, of course, Texas. You gotta get Texas Everything's right there. Too. Texas. Everything, <laughs> everything's better. So not only do you live in the most prideful country, and you're probably one of the most prideful people, but you also live in the most prideful region. So there you go. We might have to deal with this a little bit. Um, I'll go Nancy, then I'll come back to you, Terry. Sorry, did, anybody else on this Proverbs? Are you continuing the Proverbs? Yes. Right on. It says, by my, this version says, by insolence comes nothing but strife. And I looked up insolence. Insolence is rude and disrespectful behavior. So it says, with rude and disrespectful behavior comes strife. So if we're rude and disrespectful or someone's rude and disrespectful, we have strife. But if we have, but if uh, those who are taking advice, it is wisdom. If we, if we don't be rude and disrespectful and we take advice, it's wisdom. Yeah. So... I actually like that, looking at the definition of the word. Pride usually comes out as rude and disrespectful, doesn't it? Um, most of the time when you're practicing pride, pride can also be a good thing. And you, take, you take pride in, in your relationship with God, you take pride in your family. Um, but when it comes out as disrespectful and rude is when you cause strife. Absolutely. Continue. Yeah, well, I, always, I always think of pride as something that we've accomplished on our own. And that's why it's wrong. When we're proud of something we have no control over, or God caused it, that's a sin. You know, Satan, God created him beautiful. He didn't create himself beautiful. God did, but he was proud of that. Yeah. Again, it's, it's letting us take, take ownership over something that's that extra. God yeah. general is like necessarily all bad yes um can pride get in the way and cause strife absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, but 
being like being a proud Christian and like mm-hmm. praising that from the rooftops of, you know, here I am and I, this is this is what I believe in. Like, that's not bad. So it just it depends. I think depends on the circumstance and like how we how we take it and how we run with it. Mm-hmm. What about being proud in the work you do? Yes, and like, doing a good job. Doing a good job. And, and see, that one's like right on the line of what Nancy's talking about because it can be proud of what God has blessed you with and the skill set that he gave you and that you can be a good steward, right? And then there's also just a step beyond that is, man, I'm so good, <laughs> right? And then it's like, oh, now this is pride in what I can do, not what God can do. So putting it in perspective, super important. Oh, JD's continuing it. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. So I think we're maybe the way to extrapolate it out a little bit is we talk about iron sharpening iron, Christian sharpening Christian. If it's done in a heart of honesty and trust and all that, then the strife doesn't happen. But often, egos get in the way, the pride factor kicks in, and that's where we lose it. And Mm -hmm. I think that's human nature in and of itself, too. But we need to take that step back of humility to be open to it. But it all comes down to that foundation of building trust. Yeah. with the people in which you're interacting. Yeah. And, and again, I think a lot of times the iron sharpening iron interactions, you, you hear that and you already hear that that's hard, right? You can, you can visualize like swords hitting each other. Those don't usually come, if it's done right, that's not out of pride. That's out of trying to sharpen one another. And so, yeah, I think that's a tough thing. Uh, did we come back to somebody? Okay. <laughs> it just it disappeared on me. I'm like, I don't know. Okay, go for it, Nancy. I think- I try to stay away from the word pride because, and, and I look at myself like, is this something that I have done that I can be proud of? Or is this something that God has done through me mm-hmm. and that I shouldn't take any pride in it because God is the one that did it. A lot of times when I'm working and I'm struggling on something and I say a prayer and the answer comes to me, that answer didn't come to me because of me. It came to me because God gave me the answer. Mm-hmm. So I don't take pride in that. My mom had given me, she had said something to me. Oh, you, you've been so lucky in that, your life, so blessed. You did work so hard. I said, no, everything that I have is because of God. Mm-hmm. God gave me my mind. He gave me my, my blessings that I've had. It's not because of me. It's because of him. So I take no pride in anything. I try yeah. not to, and I try to really watch myself when I say proud, pride, like that. I'm proud to be an American. It should be, I'm grateful to be an American. We didn't do anything to become an American. We were blessed with being born in the United yeah. States to become an American. Not anything that we did. God bless sure. us, so it should be changed. I'm grateful. Yeah. Oh, I thought she was going to drop the mic. She went like this afterward. Um, <laughs> The thing. Yeah, absolutely. So the hard thing about pride is it's not only the word kale. I'm going to let you have this battery. I'm going to let you swap it out. It's right there on the back. Okay, I'll give it back to you. The thing about pride is we see it in our actions more than in the words, right? And so sometimes, even though we would never say proud of something, or we have pride in something. We do have pride in something. Uh, You're probably proud of the person you voted for because you didn't vote for the other person, right? You're probably proud of maybe a a purchase you made or some work you have done and, or whatever it might be. It's a heart thing, right? And it, it hangs out there and you might never identify it as that word. And Nancy's hanging out on the word. It's a great thing to think about. I'm grateful to God to Give me discernment to not vote for the other guy. You're kind of skirting around pride a little bit there, right? But we can, we can fall into that trap very, very often. All right, continued on pride thoughts. It's Kim and Dennis, so we'll go Dennis and then Kim since it works for you better, Kale. Uh, Kale's right there behind you. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of times uh, I don't, you know, I've heard plenty of, you know, sermons and comments and lessons against pride over the years and I mean there is passages that way but also the Bible talks about this and that in people that are ashamed and we can do this or that and not be ashamed 
And uh, the opposite of pride, of course, is shame. You show me a man with no pride, I'll show you a man with no shame. <laughs> we have them all around us all the time. And uh, uh, I, uh, somewhere in between there, but I think the pride that Jesus is talking about and the Bible writers is, a, is kind of an arrogance, a better than thou, uh, like Nancy was pointing out, uh, as though everything I have or do that is good uh, is some accomplishment of my own when sometimes I simply fell into it. Mm. And uh, I, but then, uh, as she pointed out, we need to be thankful, grateful. But I, I don't, you know, if we can't be proud to some degree in the, <clears throat> the usual benign sense, I'm thinking, well then, boy, I love your new baby. It's just beautiful. Oh, right. it ain't nothing. <laughs> You're soon going to wipe out gratitude and thankfulness because... Nothing that you have. How can you be thankful for anything yep. if you're not kind of proud of it or happy with it? Or, so maybe we didn't need more study on that word and its converse, ashamed. And uh, I don't know. Yeah, and I think that's what Kim was. Uh, let's come over to Kim because she had a hand a bit ago. Kale, can you run the mic? Oh, Nancy's going to do it. Look at that. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of what you were saying a bit ago too. Well, and that's the thing is, is can't we have, can't we be grateful that, God gave us the ability to do this and still be proud of it. Like, I am proud of my life because I've turned it around like tenfold, but I am grateful that I was given the grace to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, again, that's focusing where the pride comes from. It's the God kind of there. Yeah. All right. Nancy, on this topic, with this, this little, this is one sentence that has the most discussion today. Well, I like it. When we look, I don't know the verses, but we've just read them. God tells the Israelites, when you go into this land and you possess it, you remember you didn't build the cisterns, you didn't build the wells, yeah. you didn't, you didn't plant these crops. This is me. God gave this to you. Do not forget. Don't start thinking that you acquire these things through your own works, through your own stuff. Always remember you're here and you're blessed because God blessed you, not because of what you did. Yeah, that was very true for them. That was exactly the example given. All right, I know Terry had a new thought. Oh, Jeff. Just a quick note on that beautiful statement she made. <clears throat> when we start thinking that we're responsible for our success and all of the joy and it's the I am generation. I did it. I, there's no, there's, there's no in between. And when we can take a breath, Jeff, when we can really, and I've, I've come to terms with this in, in the state of gratitude. It wasn't me. Mm -hmm. It was him that was there. It was he that did that. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that was his fingerprints. And that realization really rocked my morning one morning, not too long ago. And, uh, I'm just grateful for, uh, uh, the state of gratitude that I live in, the little things, because it's all because of our Father. Yeah, right on. Pride in the right things. All right, up here to Terry. She has a completely new thought. This is working pretty well, too, continuing the thought, and then uh, we'll see if I can keep it up for the following weeks. So you preached an interesting sermon on Noah and the rest of the story. I've never heard a sermon on the parable of talents and the rest of the story which would be verse 27. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Never heard a sermon on that verse. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say Luke 19, right? Which would be on the uh, 20th? Oh, uh, no, it would be on the 18th still. It's right there at the end. Yeah, so this is, uh, <laughs> yeah, the very last verse. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Yeah, two teams. There's no in between. Like Jeff was saying, there's, there's uh, kind of, the, we fall into that trap. There's no in between. All right, any last thoughts today? Because we're, we're getting close on time. Brenda's over there. Perfect. 
Also, Terry likes to say, these are things I've never heard a sermon on. She, she gave me a piece of printed out paper the other day, sermons you'll probably never hear, and then I gave one of them. So, you're welcome. All right, Brenda. Um, pride, I think of Paul, and he talked about everything that he could boast of, but he only boasted about being in Christ. Mm -hmm. But also like in 2 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 11, he, he was given a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble and to realize that you can glorify God with difficulties. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think we can sometimes fall into the trap of trying to have pride and glorify God and actually just work it back a full circle to us. Like, I am, I am so proud of how God has blessed me and how I'm allowed to have all of these motorcycles. You should look at it, this one. You know, it's like it's come full back circle. Um, and then we're starting to have pride in the things we have acquired again that, in that example. So, yeah, we have to be careful. And, and Paul's a great example. All right, Nancy, probably our last comment. The king, bring him in front of me so I may and kill them so I can see it. Mm -hmm. I believe, and I don't have the scriptures, and God says to the Israelites, I am your king. I believe that somewhere in there, he says, I'm your king. And he set them up to be ruled by judges. But it wasn't good enough. They wanted an earthly king. They didn't mm -hmm. want their godly king. And God gave them earthly kings. And you see how, how they worked bad out. that went. <laughs> Just after two kings, the, the kingdom was divided. <laughs> but uh, We're going we're gonna to get the opportunity to look at that history in the one-year Bible here pretty quick, right? And um, it's so funny how they want a king, and God's like, how about you have some judges? And they, they take a look at all these judges, for the most part, who are all terrible, right? Um, and they're like, nah, we, still, we, st we want this again, but like higher. You know, we still want a king. And it's so funny to me to see that perspective of all all of this failed attempt, oh, it'll be better next time if we just give them more power, right? So we'll see that. Judges is coming up pretty quick. Um, you know, we're cruising through Joshua, and it's next. So uh, we'll get to see some of that history. All right. We'll be back in 10 minutes or so for our, our assembly time. Thank you guys for all of your comments. We'll pick up reading in Judges uh, chapter 1 next week. So there you go. You get to look at those judges. Thank you for all your comments. It was great.